Good morning. We welcome you today. Let's stand together as we begin our time this morning in worship. Would you go to the Lord in prayer with me? Father, we thank you today for who you are. Lord, thank you that you loved us so much that you came into this world. Lord, we stand in awe of you this morning. Your amazing mercy and your love and your grace. And so, Lord, in these moments today, I pray that our hearts would be open to receive what you want to do in us. Lord, as we hear your word, I pray that we would have ears to hear and that our hearts would be willing to, to change and to walk in what you want us to do. Father, thank you for the opportunity today to come into this place and to worship you. We pray this in your name, Lord. Amen. Let's sing together. With me. Angels from the realms of glory, wing your flight o'er all the earth. He who sang creation's story, now proclaim Messiah's birth. Come and worship, come and worship, worship Christ the newborn King. Shepherds in the fields abiding, watching o'er your flocks by night. God with man is now residing, yonder shines the infant light. Come and worship, come and worship, worship Christ the newborn King. Let's greet one another this morning. We're so glad you're here. that Jesus came into this world that was dirty and that was yucky and that was filled with sin and he came into that little stable and was born and was placed in that manger he is Emmanuel he has come for us <laughs>
The Son of God, you born to me, a crown of thorns would pierce his brow, and we beheld this offering, exalted now, the King of kings, praise God for the hallowed This next song is one that most all of us know. O little town of Bethlehem. Let's sing it together. How still we see thee lie Upon thy deep and dreamless sleep The silent stars go by Yet in thy dark street shine The everlasting light the hopes and fears of all the years are met in thee tonight. For Christ is born of man. While mortals sleep, the angels keep their watch of wandering light. O morning stars together, proclaim the holy birth, and praise as sing. Oh, wow. 
child of Bethlehem, descend to us, we pray. Has out our sin and be born in us today. We hear the Christmas angels, the great glad tidings tell. Oh, come to us, abide with us, our Lord Emmanuel. You may be seated. My name is Phil, and along with my wife Becca and our two boys, we are your missionaries serving in Vienna, Austria. Because of your generous giving, we are able to share the light of Christ to the nearly two million people who don't know the good news. So thank you for giving to the cooperative program and to the Lottie Moon Christmas offering so that our family can live here, gather locals, to study God's word and plant new churches. Okay, yeah, we're fanging on. All right, good morning, everybody. It's really good to see you. Would you get your Bibles, please, your copy of God's word, and turn to Matthew chapter 2. Matthew chapter 2. While you're turning, I want to remind you it is the Christmas season, if you're unaware. And around here, what goes with Christmas season is Lottie Moon Christmas Offering. Now, if you're unfamiliar with Lottie Moon and the Christmas Offering, what it is is we as Baptists together pool our money to do missions around the world. And this is one of those offerings that we take up at this time of year to help support that ministry. 100%, every dime that you give during the Lottie Moon Christmas Offering goes to missionary work around the world. You, were, you support over 400 missionaries uh, around the world who are working to start new churches, lead people to Christ. It's, it's quite a deal. And so during this Christmas season, I, was, I know some of you did Operation Christmas Child. And if that's all you can pull together, that is perfectly fine. This is just an option to you uh, concerning... Uh, the ministries that we do around here. Also, out here in the foyer, some of you may not know this, we have this little mailbox. And the purpose of the mailbox is, one, uh, it's a place for you to give your Christmas cards to the people in our church. Uh, and the other thing is, instead of buying postage for those, uh, for those uh, Christmas cards, whatever money you save on postage, give that to Lottie Moon. That's one of the reasons that we have that out there. So bring your Christmas cards up here for our, for our church family. And if the Lord leads, you can then give that postage money and whatever the Lord leads you to, to give towards missions. The Lottie Moon Christmas offering. Pretty cool deal. One more thing before we get started. We're beginning to have some issues with our sound system. It's little things, but if you know, if you know your TVs and your the stuff you have at home, once you start having issues, they begin to be big issues. And, and you never notice the sound or the video until something goes wrong, right? <laughs> That's the only time you notice that stuff. And so we're having to look at doing some upgrades uh, in, our, in our system. And as you know, that stuff is expensive. And so we're looking at uh, a minimum of $20,000 to upgrade our soundboard where, where a lot of the problems are and all the stuff that goes with it, you know, as you buy something, everything else that kind of goes with it is obsolete, so you have to buy all that stuff. And it, if, we, if we go for all the bells and whistles, it could be as high as forty, forty-five, fifty thousand dollars $50,000. So here's what we're, we're saying. We just want you to begin to pray about that. We're, we're not making a move yet. We're going to bring it to the church at some point. This is what we're, we're looking at doing, and then you guys will decide what we'll all decide together what we do. But just wanted to make you aware of that, that, uh, that we need to make these upgrades before we begin to have serious problems and it becomes distracting and 
Of course, we've got online stuff and all of that, and it all has to work properly in order for us to get the word out the way we need to. And so there it is. There's the information. If you have any questions, ask me. Ask the guys back here in the, in the sound booth uh, about what we're looking at. But that's, what we're, that's what's before us, and so we'll do it together. Amen? Amen. We'll do it together. All right, Matthew chapter 2, beginning in verse 1. Jesus was born in Bethlehem in Judea during the reign of King Herod. About that time, some wise men from eastern lands arrived in Jerusalem asking, Where is the newborn king of the Jews? We saw his star as it rose, and we've come to worship him. King Herod was deeply disturbed when he heard this, as was everyone in Jerusalem. He called a meeting of the leading priests and teachers of religious law and asked, Where is the Messiah supposed to be born? In Bethlehem of Judea, they said, for this is what the prophet wrote. And you, O Bethlehem, in the land of Judah, are not least among the ruling cities of Judah, for a ruler will come from you who will be the shepherd of my people Israel. Then Herod called for a private meeting with the wise men, and he learned from them the time when the star first appeared. Then he told them, go to Bethlehem and search carefully for the child, and when you find him, come back and tell me so that I can go and worship him too. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you for your word, and we thank you for the opportunity to look at it together. Have us to hear what you want us to hear. It's in your blessed name we pray. Amen. I've always been intrigued by the story of December 17th, 1903. Does that ring a bell with anyone? How about this little bit of information? It concerns two young men at Kitty Hawk, North Carolina. Ring a bell? Orville and Wilbur Wright. They did something to me is just one of the most fascinating things. I would rather go to an air show watch the Thunderbirds or, or, or the Blue Angels, go look at airplanes, go to those flying museums. I'd rather do that than just about anything else in the world. Completely and totally fascinated by flight, by space flight. The Smithsonian uh, Air and Space Museum, oh my goodness, I could spend days. It's just a thing with me. But it's not for everybody, right? And here is an example. After they flew, right, Big deal. They're so excited that they, that they actually got off the ground. So they sent a telegram to their sister Catherine in Ohio. Remember telegrams, very expensive, before telephones, all that sort of thing. So in the telegram, they sent this simple message. We have flown 120 feet. We will be home for Christmas. Well, she was so excited, right? She took the message down to the newspaper editor because this was big news, right? He read the telegram, he looked at it and said, oh, how wonderful, the boys are coming home for Christmas. He completely missed what could be the most monumental news of the entire 20th century. Man had flown, and all he saw was, the boys are going to be home for Christmas. That happens every year at this time of year. This world overlooks what this is really all about. You know, it's overshadowed by lights and trees and gifts and wrappings and partings. And folks, there's nothing wrong with any of that. Absolutely nothing wrong with it. Enjoy. But so many miss the most monumental news, not just of the century, but in history, the Savior has arrived. As a part of all of that story, I think in the act actual Christmas story that we have overlooked for years something that is that is pretty important and it is the fact that these wise men brought gifts and that those gifts have significance and so that is why this Christmas we have chosen to take a little time to focus on the gifts that the wise men brought James Montgomery Boyce who's a who's a scholar right Christian scholar he He says this about about the gifts. He said, linguistically, because these gifts appear at the end of the story, after the child has been born, they occupy in the text a place of prominence. And that's why we want to slow down this Christmas season and just 
Just examine these gifts. What's, what's important about them? Is there anything that they signify? So let's go to verse 9. Let's continue the story. Matthew chapter 2, verse 9. This is on the screen. After this interview with King Herod, the wise men went their way, and the star that, had, that they had seen in the east guided them to Bethlehem. It went ahead of them and stopped over the place where the child was. When they saw the star, they were filled with joy. They entered the house and saw the child. Now notice, entered the house, not the manger. They entered the house and saw the child, not the baby, the child with his mother Mary, and they bowed down and worshipped him. Then they opened their treasure chests and gave him gifts of gold, frankincense, and myrrh. Now, as a result of the Christmas carol and a lot of other things, that Christmas carol that was written back in 1857, we noted this last week, We've gotten a little confused about this entire story of the wise men. We immediately, all of us think that there's three wise men. We don't have any idea how many wise men there were. The text doesn't tell us. It just tells us there were three gifts. It tells us the, the, the song, We three kings of Orient are marrying gifts, we traverse afar. It tells us that they were kings from the Orient. We don't know where they were from. They were from somewhere east of Israel. That's, that's all it says. They're not kings either. They were magi or what we would call wise men. And as we just read in the text here, they didn't come to the manger, right? I told everybody last week that if you set up your nativity scene, you know, on your mantle or whatever, to be accurate, biblically accurate, take your three wise men, okay, or two or 12, however many, and take them about six blocks away and put them somewhere over here, okay? That would be biblical. Your nativity would then be biblically accurate because they think that these wise men showed up as much as two years after the birth of Christ. We say all that to just be careful how you read the scriptures. There's a lot of people that assume that there's stuff in there that's it's not. Read carefully. Study carefully. Okay? Now, Matthew wanted us to know he's the only one that records this story. And remember, the, the, the gospel of Matthew is written to a bunch of Jews. And what Matthew is trying to convince these Jewish people that he wrote this letter for, he's trying to convince them that Jesus Christ is indeed the Messiah, that he is indeed a king. And so, I believe with all of my heart that that's the reason Matthew included these three gifts as a result of the story of the birth of Christ. It's because they're significant. They're, they're important because they're emblematic. They are, they are a, a, a type of prophecy, you might say, as to who Jesus is and what he would do. Now, last week we discussed the fact that they brought the first gift, which is gold, right? They brought gold. Well, what does gold signify? We discussed the fact that, that gold is a gift for royalty, that any time you approached a king, especially back in those days, you always brought a gift. And a part of that gift always included gold. Why? Because it is a gift fit for a king. Jesus is the king of kings. But now we come to the gift of frankincense. What is frankincense? I'm so glad that you asked. Frankincense is a resin from a very particular tree. That's the tree right there. Uh, this, this, this stuff is highly prized, very sought after, and it's very expensive. It comes from, from this tree, scientific name, which is Boswellia therifera, okay? I know you wanted to know that, so there you are. It comes from, this tree only grows on the Arabian Peninsula. You will find it, or, or in northern parts of, of eastern Africa. Uh, you'll find it in Saudi Arabia, in Somalia, in Oman, and Yemen, and frankincense, as you'll notice, that's not anywhere near, well, it's kind of near, but it's not in Israel. So the only way that this stuff got into Israel was through a caravan. It had to be imported, which means it was very, very expensive. Now, the resin is harvest, harvested by making an incision on the trunk of the tree in the winter months of the year, and the sap begins to run out. That sap is collected, and then it is dried and hardened and crystallized, and then back in the day, what they would do is they would take these, these little crystallized rocks of resin, right? And they would grind them up into powder, and then they would burn them. And apparently, it smells great. 
I have never personally that I'm aware of smelled frankincense. Maybe some of you have, but the description is a, a woodsy, balsamy kind of a fragrance. Highly, highly sought after way back in the day. So that, technically, is frankincense. Now, why is it important? It's important because to those of us who read Scripture... It appears 17 times in our Bible, and almost every single time it's associated with this right here. Number one in your notes. In the Bible, frankincense is associated with the priesthood of Israel. It is a substance used for priests and a substance that is used by priests in the worship of the one true God. What they would do is they would, take this, they would take some olive oil and they would mix that olive oil with some frankincense and they would use it to anoint... Uh, new priests as priests. They would be anointing them into the priesthood, marking them for service. But it was also used by the priest in a very particular offering that is called the grain offering. Now, what the grain offering is, is it's an offering of thanksgiving. What they would do is they would, they would uh, bring your first fruits. You know, if you have a big crop of, of uh, wheat, the first few bundles that were collected, you take them immediately and offer them as, as a thanksgiving gift to God for the harvest that you're about to give. You take the first of it, not the end of it. Well, what if the first is the best? It's an offering of faith as well. That's the reason the tithe. Tithe is, is the first fruits. We bring the first of what we have. We are, we are echoing that truth from the Old Testament offerings that were given in, in, in those days. Now, we have an example of this in the Old Testament book of Leviticus. Now, I know you've probably read this lately and done your study through the book of Leviticus, but I'll refresh your memory just in case you're a little rusty. Leviticus chapter 2, verse 2, bring it, talking about the grain offering, bring it to Aaron's sons, the priests. The priests will scoop out a handful of flour moistened with oil together with all the frankincense and burn this representative portion on the altar. It is a special gift, a pleasing aroma to the Lord. It's like, it's as if God in heaven goes, ooh, that, that's good. I, I like that, right? Now, I don't know that he actually smells it, but what it's about, it's about obedience. It's about, it's about gratitude. It's about thanksgiving. That's what the offering is all about. It's about thanking the Lord for what he has so graciously provided. And God says, when you do it that way, when you thank me and you're obedient to me, that's good stuff. It's pleasing to God the Father. Now, this is also an offering that Paul had in mind when he wrote to the Philippian church in chapter 4 concerning the financial giving that was supporting his ministry. Look at it here, uh, Philippians chapter 4. At the moment, I have, I have all I need and more. I am generously supplied with the gifts that you sent me with Epaphroditus. They are a sweet-smelling sacrifice that is acceptable and pleasing to God. Paul is referencing back to this grain offering that we read about in Leviticus. It's what David referred to in Psalm 141. Look at this. Accept my prayers as incense. That's the same word for frankincense. Offered to you and my upraised hands as an evening offering. So it's a substance used by Jewish priests in the worship of the God of Israel in the Old Testament. Now, my next question is, yeah, but what would a bunch of pagan wise men do bringing this gift to Jesus. Well, what's going on there? Well, as I said earlier, it's emblematic. It's prophetic, all right? One of the roles that Jesus would play is that of our great high priest. We know this because, really, it's a main theme of the book of Hebrews. I mean, it's a great theme in the book of Hebrews. It might even be the, the theme of Hebrews. Eleven times in that book, it tells us that Jesus Christ is our great high priest. You and I have a great high priest. Now, you might be sitting there, what's the big deal about that? Are we talking like the Catholics have a priest? Is, it, is that what we're saying? And Well, yeah, kind of, because what a priest is, is somebody who represents people to God. You see, Jesus is, is God's representative to God in heaven on our behalf. 
You see, we don't need an earthly priest because we have a great high priest in heaven. Look at this, Hebrews chapter 4, verse 14. So then, since we have a great high priest who has entered heaven, Jesus the Son of God, let us hold firmly to what we believe. Verse 15, this high priest of ours understands our weaknesses. How cool is this? He was human. He knows what it's like to be tired and hungry. He knows what loss feels like. He's been through it all. This high priest of ours understands our weaknesses, for for he faced all the same testings, all the same stuff we do, yet he did not sin. That's the theme of the book of Hebrews. And the writer of that book goes to great lengths to say that Jesus Christ's priesthood is so much better than anything that a human being could, could provide. It's so much better. Why? Because of who Jesus is and what he has done. So, we have a substance used by Jewish priests, given by pagan wise men to a child who would become what the Bible calls the great high priest. The reason for this gift now begins to make a little sense. So, what does Jesus do as our great high priest that is so important? Again, Hebrews chapter 10, verse 11. Under the Old Covenant, Old Testament, Jewish all of that stuff. Under the old covenant, the priest stands and ministers before the altar day after day, offering the same sacrifices again and again, which can never, listen to this, which can never take away sins. Verse 12, but our high priest offered himself to God as a single sacrifice for sin, good for all time. Now notice this, maybe something you didn't know. Then he sat down in the place of honor at God's right hand. Now, I want you to notice that little phrase, he sat down. Why is that, why is that so important? Why is that included? Wouldn't it just be he went to heaven and he's there? No, this is important. He sat down. Why? It's important for all of us to understand that the work of a priest was never done. Never done. Because people kept sinning and they had to deal temporarily with that sin. So day after day, month after month, year after year, century after century, the priests are offering this sacrifice, working on behalf of the people to reconcile with God. If you've ever done a a study of of the tabernacle or the temple, there is one significant piece of furniture that's missing. I don't know if you ever noticed this. It's got all kinds of stuff in it, but you know what's missing? A chair. There is not a chair anywhere in the tabernacle or the temple. Why? Because the work's never done. It's just never done. Over and over and over and over. But then, praise the Lord, here comes Jesus. He comes And he acts as our great high priest, offering himself as a sacrifice. Number three, as our priest, Jesus offers himself as a one-time sacrifice for sin. He is the Lamb of God. Remember, we talked about this a few weeks ago, going through the book of John. He's the Lamb of God. He he comes, he's born, he, he lives a perfect, sinless life. He dies, he's raised, he ascends into heaven, and then he sits down. Which can mean only one thing, folks. And here's the good news. It's done. His work is finished. He said on the cross, what did he say? It is time to sit down. It's done. What Jesus did on the cross is more than sufficient to take care of the sins of the world. Every single person, past, present, future that has ever lived or ever will live, it's done. So he sat down. He's finished. Also, however, to sit down at the right hand of God or the right hand of a ruler, the right hand of a monarch is also very significant because there's only one kind of person who would sit at the right hand of a monarch in those days. It was either a military general which Jesus is going to be at the end of time, amen? He's coming to conquer. But also, wait for it, priests, wise men, those close advisors to the king. So Jesus sat down signifying 
The work of salvation is done. It is finished. But that's not all. Jesus is also the great high priest interceding for us. Look in Hebrews 7.25. Therefore, he, Jesus, is able once and forever to save those who come to God through him. It has to be through him, but you come through him, you're saved. Your salvation is secure. You, have, you are adopted into the family of God. Amazing thing here. But look at this last sentence. He lives forever. This is what a high priest does. He lives forever to intercede with God on their behalf. This is fascinating. This is just, I have so nerded out on this. This is just, this is just such awesome stuff. Listen to this. Have you ever had somebody say, you're going through a hard time? Maybe you lost somebody in your family, you're going through a sickness. Somebody you trust comes up and says, man, I'm praying for you. Every time I think about you, I'm lifting your name up. There's a comfort in that, right? It's pretty awesome to know that there are people who love you enough to take their very valuable time and spend it interceding for you before the Father. But you know what's awesomer? Jesus is praying nonstop, 24-7, 365, for you. Number four, Jesus himself is interceding for you. Now, if you're unfamiliar with another book of the Bible, it's the book of Job, It's a book in the Old Testament, and many scholars believe it is the oldest book in the Bible. Many believe that the book of Job even predates Abraham. I mean, it is old, all right? And if you know anything about the story of Job, Job has to deal with a great deal of suffering, all right? He has to deal with the lost family, loss of income, loss of career, loss of everything. And he's trying to deal with all of this. And at one point in chapter 9, verse 33 of the book of Job, he says, if there were, if only there was a mediator between us, between who? Us and God. If there was just someone who could intercede on my behalf. Someone who could bring, notice the language, who could bring us together. Centuries later, this baby shows up, this child comes on the scene, and he is described as a mediator, a middleman, if you were, that Job and all of us so desperately need. Paul says in 1 Timothy 2, verse 5, there is one God, and notice, and one mediator, capital M, that's Jesus who can reconcile God and humanity, the man, Christ Jesus. Now, in our culture, the middleman is something we really want to avoid, right? Middleman kind of has a bad connotation to it. You know, what it means for us is prices go up, right? Because you got to pay the middleman. That's the reason we think that Sam's and Costco are so cool, because in our minds, it's, we're missing the middleman. You know, you miss the middleman, go directly to the warehouse. They've got a pretty good scam going on. Anyway... But you see, you can't do that when it concerns salvation. You can't get there on your own. You desperately need a middleman. You need the man, Christ Jesus, who is a mediator, a bridge between you and God. And by the way, Jesus is the perfect middleman. Because in relating to God, he can relate because he is God. He's perfect, right? And in dealing with mankind, he can relate because he became a man. He knows exactly what it's like to live on this planet, to struggle, to be poor, to experience joy and sadness. Theologians call this the theanthropic nature of God, of Christ. He is fully God and fully man, the perfect representative to bring us together, the perfect man, the perfect priest. There's, there's really a great example of what a middleman does in the New Testament. Paul, he wrote this little bitty short letter called Philemon. And in this short one-chapter book, 
He's writing a letter to Philemon, who is apparently a man of, of wealth. He, had, he, uh, he has slaves. And I want to I remind you that back in those days, slave wasn't the way we think of slave. Most, you know, 99% of the time, slaves back then, what they were doing is maybe they'd gotten in debt. And so they indenture themselves to the person to which they are in debt. And they work the debt off. That, that, that's how that worked back in the day. You didn't have banks, as it were. So you worked off your debt. So there was this guy who had a slave named Onesimus. And Onesimus apparently stole a bunch of stuff, ran away, tried to get out from under his obligation to work off his debt. He ends up in Rome, runs into Paul. Paul starts a conversation with him, leads him to Jesus. And now he's telling Onesimus, you need to make this right. So we have this, we have this runaway And we have this owner. So Paul writes a letter to Philemon on behalf of Onesimus. Paul, in other words, stands in the gap. He's a middleman. Philemon, verse 18. If he has wronged you, talking about Onesimus to Philemon, if he has wronged you in any way or owes you anything, charge it to me. I, Paul, and you'll notice this is in caps. I didn't do that. That's the way the scriptures record it. It's because apparently Paul had very poor eyesight. And so when he had somebody else write his letters for him, they would dictate it. And then he says, I, Paul, this last little sentence, write this with my own hand. It's in big letters because he can't see. I will repay it. Paul wanted to make sure that Philemon understood, I'm going to take care of this debt. So what's he doing? He's being a middleman. He's bringing the two sides together. Paul stood in the gap for Onesimus and Philemon. Well, Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior, King of kings, he is the ultimate mediator, the ultimate middleman. He is our great high priest. He died. He rose. He ascended to the right hand of the Father. He's the perfect advocate. And that, folks, is why these pagan wise men brought the gift of frankincense whether they understood the truth of it or not. You know, God works in mysterious ways, right? Jesus is our great high priest. I'll close with this story. True story, by the way. In 1936, when radio was the height of technology, there was a historic radio broadcast that was going to take place between England and the United States of America, one of the first to ever happen. This was such a big deal. King Edward VIII, the dad of Elizabeth, was going to speak to the good people of the United States via a cable running under the Atlantic Ocean through a station in New York City, and everything was ready. So in England, there in the palace, the king approaches his microphone, and just as Just a few moments before this was about to begin, some guy was running across the floor, snagged one of the wires with his his toe, and popped it in two. Well, of course, the executives, the producers, they're freaking out. Well, this young, very bright, very sharp little engineer knew exactly what to do. He picked up one end of the wire. He picked up the other end of the wire. And the words of the King of England literally were transmitted through the body of that electrical engineer. That's the role Jesus Christ plays as our priest. Heaven's voice is transmitted through the person of Jesus Christ. He is the image of the invisible God. He reveals God's intent. He reveals God's word. He reveals God's will. No wonder it is Jesus who said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. Of course they brought him frankincense. Of course they did. Why? Therefore he is able once and forever to save those who come to God through him. He lives forever to intercede with God on our behalf. Jesus Christ is our great high priest. Amen? Hallelujah.
Let's pray. I just get blown away by your word and how it all fits together. I just love your word and what it reveals about who you are, how you planned all of this out, how you literally are in control of every aspect of how this works. You are to be praised beyond all others. Forgive us for giving our praise anywhere else but to you. Thank you for sending us a great high priest. Thank you for sending someone to help us because we can't help ourselves. Thank you for this season and help us to remember why it's such a big deal. Thank you for Jesus. Father, I just ask that you would help us to soak up the truth of this, to spend some time over the next day or two just meditating on the truths that are revealed in gold and frankincense. Crazy that two little substances, two, two words can mean so much. It's just, Father, may we stand in awe May we just stand in awe of who you are. Father, is there someone here who doesn't know you as Savior? Is there someone here who has never received the gift, not the gift of gold or frankincense, the gift of you? Is there someone here who has not received that gift today? Father, give them the courage to deal with that. If there's any question at all, where they stand with you, Father, give them the courage to deal with that. Give them the courage to come talk to me, talk to a friend, talk to a family, talk to someone. The most, Father, help every single one of us to understand that that is the most important decision in life. That we can't play games with it. We can't, we can't have apathy. And then, Father, for those of us who are a part of your family, Help us to worship in gratitude for all that you've done. Help us to be ready and willing to share that good news with the people around us. Help us to take advantage of this season. We love you. Thank you for being our high priest. Okay, head bowed, eyes closed. I'm going to ask you to make two decisions. One, do you know Jesus? If you don't, fix it. It really is up to you. Nobody else. It's up to you. The gift is being offered. You simply admit that you need the gift. You believe that Jesus is the gift. And then you receive the gift. That's all there is to it. We'll help you with the rest of it, but we can't help you with that part of it. You have to make that decision yourself. Would you be willing to make that decision today? Second, if you're a follower, do we need to up our passion level for who he is and what he's done? Again, nerding out on something like frankincense just, just reveals to me how intricate and, and how big and how awesome our Lord is. Maybe those of us who have been following for years, maybe we just need a good shot of passion when it comes to who Jesus is. That means sinking your life into the Word, sinking your life into the family. Do you need to up your game? Are you finding yourself in a season of just, eh, 
A Christian should never be meh. Never. That means there's something wrong. Would you be willing to deal with that today? So I'm going to be here at the front, and I'm here to talk to you. Now, if coming forward right now in front of all these people freaks you out, that's groovy. I'll be here after the service. But if the Lord is scratching at the back of your brain right now, or maybe he's pounding on it, I don't know, don't let this moment pass. Because you let this moment pass, it just becomes harder the next time. So if he's speaking to you, talk to somebody. I would love to be that somebody. I'm here. Chris is playing. If the Lord is leading, come on.
Father, we thank you for moving in this room this morning. Father, I know there are others. Help us to lean into you. Help us to trust in you. Help us to lean into the family. Father, we're losing commitment to the body of Christ, and it's killing us. We're trying to walk by ourselves in isolation, and it's killing us. We were never meant to do this alone. Father, I just, I just pray that you would help us to see the truth in all of that, that we need you and we need each other. Sure do love you. And we thank you for the manger, the beginning of the greatest story that's ever been told. Thank you for Jesus. It's in your name we pray. Amen. Now, as we continue in our worship, we, uh, we, we do what the wise men did. We bring gifts. We bring the gift of what is called a tithe, 10%, the first fruits of what God has so graciously provided to us. As part of the service, we have these these boxes on the wall. We have, you can send that through the mail. It doesn't matter how you get it here. What's important is, is what it represents. It re represents trust. It's simply what it is. Jesus says, if you bring this, I'll bless you. And it really comes down to, wait, 10%, that's a lot. Man, I got bills. Do you trust? Do you trust him? It's discipleship. It's obedience. Now, as I talked earlier about the missionaries, we take your tithes, your, when you bring your gifts to Jesus, then we also tithe as a church body, and we support missions all around the world. Again, it's Christmas time, so Lottie Moon is sort of the focus of that entire endeavor. And so we bring you stories of missionaries every week to help you remember that this is bigger than planes. This is bigger than our individual lives. This is about the gospel worldwide. And also, would you get in the habit of writing that name down? Put it on your fridge. And just as you're going about your week and you see David and Shannon, you have to spend 45 minutes, be with be with Shannon and David today. See to their needs. I don't know what they are. You do. See to their needs today. Intercede on their behalf before the Lord. All right? Who's telling our story today? Mr. David Barks. Thank you for doing this for us. Good morning. Good morning. David and Shannon Brown in Moldova. After Russia invaded Ukraine in the spring of 2022, a woman named Olga, along with her family, fled and were welcomed on the border country of Moldova by Christians from a Baptist church there. The church welcomed this family. Other refuge was open arms, providing for them both physical and spiritual needs. Missionaries David and Shannon partnered with the church and the Moldova Baptist Union in ministering to the Ukrainian refugees by recruiting volunteers, medical teams to meet the needs of the refugees housed throughout Moldova. Olga called her husband to tell him how well the Baptists cared for them. She was astonished by his response and he had previously forbidden his family from going to church. Praise the Lord, that's God's grace. God is good and protected you, he said. The cooperative program and the Lottie Moon Christmas offering takes the gospel to the nations and to the neighborhoods. Your financial support through these endeavors is allowing gospel's work to be impact and displace disheartened all around this world. Pray for Baptists, including the Browns in Moldova, who are ministering to the Ukrainian refugees and for God's healing among those affected by the conflicts between Russia and Ukraine. Please pray with me. Thank you, Father, for the opportunity to lift up others. Thank you for your grace and mercy in our lives, Father. Please be with David and Shannon, and please bless them where they're at, Lord, and just 
Provide them with people around them who will love them and encourage them and support them, Father. And please be with those in Ukraine and Russia and just bless them with more of you, Father. And may your spirit fall in that place and may they come to know you as Lord and Savior. Thank you for today, Father. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Thank you, David. A few announcements before we get going. I want to let you know that we do have small groups right after this. They're all around in the hallways here. And if you don't know which small group to be a part of or which one you could be a part of, we have little booklets in the hallways and down by the coffee station. You can get coffee, hot cider, all the good stuff, and then uh, ask a few questions about where you could go. Uh, next Sunday evening, our youths are having a uh, Christmas party. We're having an all-over-town scavenger hunt. I'm going to give keys to 14-year-olds, and we're just going to go at it. Um, I'm kidding. I'm kidding. <laughs> that shot some people's blood pressure through the roof. We're going to have a grand old time. I, um, I got a running bet with the kids of whether or not I can get Chick-fil-A on a Sunday, and I'm still working on it. Uh, me and Dan Cathy are talking it out and seeing if we can make it happen on Sunday. Um, so you, they're invited to that. Now, if you were a part of family night this past week, you know all about it, but if you weren't able to make it, we have a Christmas countdown that's happening. Out in the foyer, uh, in the, out here in the lobby area, you can grab a little scroll, and it's a chance for you to have a spiritual moment with you and your family, whether your family goes from baby all the way up to uh, adulthood, or it's just you and your husband. Uh, there's a chance, there's a way for you to engage in Scripture, and you can be a part of that with this. Also, we want to let you know that out in the foyer in the lobby, there is a bunch of boxes, and in those boxes, there, uh, it's labeled with uh, everybody's, uh, well, with the alphabet, and uh, for example, me and the Knights have the K's, and uh, in, in these boxes, you can put your Christmas card. You can save money on a stamp, put it in here, label it for who it goes to, and then instead of spending that money on stamps, you can send that money to the Lottie Moon offering, and it's a way for uh, us to serve you, and go back there and make sure that you get all your uh, notes and cards from everybody. They're already filling in there, and then bring your notes and cards, and you can put them in those boxes out there today. Um, I'm a pretty trusting person, but there is one thing I do not trust, and it's stairs, because they're always up to something. <laughs> wow. Merry Christmas, everybody. Merry Christmas. Remember, on Christmas Day, we're going to gather together, all right, 945, same time as always. We're just going to start in the Fellowship Hall. We're going to have donuts, coffee, juice, whatever. Just come as you are. You want to come in your pajamas? I don't care. Come on. We're just going to celebrate the Lord's birth together. And then, when we're done, whenever that is, we're going to come in here and we're going to have a time of worship. We're just going to wish Jesus a happy birthday. Okay? We'd love for you to come. Bring your extended family. But they didn't bring dress clothes. Who cares? I mean, look at me. Right? Who cares? Come on up. Let's celebrate the Lord's birth together. That's December 25th, by the way. Christmas does fall on Sunday. Uh, we figured if you got kids and you're opening up presents, they wake you up at 5 o'clock anyway. You'll be done by 945. Come on. Come on. All right? All right. Let's stand together. Joy to the world. Let's sing it. Joy to the world. The Lord is come. Let her receive her key. Let every heart prepare him room. And heaven and nature sing. And heaven and nature sing. And heaven and heaven and nature sing. Sounding 
joy, repeat the sounding joy, repeat, repeat the sounding Everybody, small groups are next. 